A Very Silent Night. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. There's a famous family portrait of a family called the Lawsons, and we're looking at it right now, and it's really the entry point to this really creepy, really dark murder case that happened on Christmas. So you look at the photo, and there is the oldest kid, Arthur, then there's his sister Marie, then there's Charles, Charlie Lawson, then there is his wife and and the rest of their kids. And this was taken, again, it looks really like one of those kind of like standard issue, older, early century photographs where no one's really smiling, no one's really enjoying themselves, everyone's dressed up in their their holiday best. Can't really tell who's older or younger. Everyone yes. looks the same age. And that also kind of factors into this case a lot. So exactly. We've got this like top tier of these adults that look like they are all kind of the same age on the same plane. The oldest son is taller than the rest of the family. Like it just feels like it's hard to know who's who and and what, what the dynamic is, I guess. I was taken in late December, 1929 days before Christmas. Again, it shows Charles Lawson's. He was 43. Fanny, his wife, 37. She's holding their baby and their seven children. Marie, age 17. Arthur, age 16. He was the one we were talking about. The oldest boy, not the oldest. Marie's the oldest. Carrie, age 12. Maybell, age 7. James, age 4. Raymond, age 2. And Mary Lou, who's just four months in her mother's arms. They went into town to buy new clothes and to have a family portrait taken. Days later, all but one of them would be dead. In 1911, Charles Lawson, or Charlie, married Fanny Manring, and they had eight children, though the third one, William, died of an illness when he was six. In 1918, Charles and Fanny followed Charles's younger brothers to Germantown, North Carolina, where they all settled in and worked as tobacco farmers. And this is part of the culture, too. A lot of the sources were from these smaller publications around this city. So they're still talking about it. It's it's still a giant case in this part of North Carolina. In 1927, Lawson saved enough money to buy their own tobacco farm on Brook Cove Road. It feels like it was the American dream, you know, these tobacco workers being able to buy their own farm, expand their family, etc., So in 1929, the family was doing pretty well. Charles and his oldest son, Arthur, went hunting a lot. Charles took the family one day to get new clothes and again to have their portraits taken. Now, it seems normal to us, and again, we talked about it feeling like a standard issue photograph from the time, but this action would have been really weird to do for their social status. They were still pretty working class, and the luxury of all new clothes for seven kids, plus a portrait, plus the parents, was a really huge luxury. At the same time, Charles was also a farm owner, although newly so, and moving up in the world. So maybe he felt like it was appropriate, you know, like given his ambitions, given his new ownership. The reason for the photo is an important part of the murders. And it's also a a point of debate why this happened. On Christmas Eve, Charlie or Charles went to his bank and withdrew the rest of his savings, which is around $60. On Christmas Day, It was freezing. There were six to eight inches of snow on the ground. Arthur Lawson, 16, was sent by his father to town to buy shotgun shells. He thought that they were going to go rabbit hunting Christmas afternoon, which was a kind of local tradition. When Arthur was away, Charles Lawson casually waited by the tobacco barn for two of his daughters, Carrie and Maybell. They were on their way to their uncle and aunt's house to say their Christmas hellos when he shot them with a 12-gauge shotgun, then bludgeoned them to death to make sure that they were dead. He dragged their bodies into the back of the tobacco barn. Then Lawson calmly walked back to the house, shooting his wife Fanny, who was hanging out on the porch. Hearing the sounds of gunfire, four-month-old Mary Lou started crying, so Lawson bludgeoned her next. Some say she went last, but it's kind of hard to say. I would assume she would be close to her mother. He then went into the kitchen where he shot his 17-year-old daughter Marie, who had just baked a raisin cake for Christmas. The two small boys, James and Raymond, who were only four and two years old, attempted to find a hiding place, but Lawson found and shot them. After all of this was done, he positioned all of the bodies by putting pillows under their heads, rocks for the two girls who were left in the barn, and crossed their arms in a kind of a funerary pose. 
and then disappeared into the woods. There, according to people who had who found him later, he was pacing, figuring out what to do next. Initially, neighbors were not alarmed by all the gunshots because, again, rabbit hunting was a real thing, a Christmas tradition, kind of a, a local pastime. But then a couple hours later, relatives arrived to wish the Lawsons a Merry Christmas, kind of what the two daughters were off about to do. And they found the bodies along with the cake, which was freshly baked. Then a gunshot was heard in the woods. It was Charles Lawson taking his own life by leaning back against a tree and using a forked stick to trigger a blast of his 12-gauge shotgun to his chest. So let's take a breather right there, and we'll come back to this horrific scene in a moment. Today's episode is sponsored by Best Fiends. Though we love what we do, Jason and I don't just Google true crime and weird history all day. Sometimes we need a freaking break. That's when I close my computer and pick up my phone for a little Best Fiends. Have you heard of it? You should because it's gotten over 100 million global downloads. We're huge fans of it, and you should be too. Best Fiends challenges your brain with fun puzzle levels, but it's not like this huge thing. It's casual. You can play one level or 17, whatever time allows for. There are enough stresses in our life right now. Don't let a game stress you out. Best Fiends is also a game anyone can play, literally. It is for adults, but honestly, anyone can and enjoy themselves. Let me break it down. Best Fiends is an awesome mobile puzzle game and honestly different from anything I've ever played. It engages my brain, it's fun, and is whatever type of commitment you want. It's so low maintenance, you don't even need the internet. The internet! Speaking of internet, I was playing Best Fiends just to chill one day, I'm close to level 200, and my power went out, and honestly, I did not even notice. I played and, like, relaxed, and I was off the grid, and it was so fantastic. I only noticed I had no power or internet when it came back on and I had to get back to whatever I was doing at the time. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hello. Hi. Hi. We're, Woo. we're checking in. Christmas time. It's a Christmas time check-in. It's a very merry check-in. Yeah, it's, it's different mm -hmm. than other holiday weeks i guess and they're always i don't know there's always a time of reflection or yeah or you know, things you look forward to or maybe you are you know what what did i do this year or how did i turn out what am i gonna get into next year yeah what didn't i do this year i mean for better or worse too but we're careening towards 2021 which is a good thing also a scary thing but but mostly a good thing i will say i'm excited for it yeah i'm always optimistic i'm always looking forward to it i kind of tend to don't have new year's resolutions i really don't do them mm -hmm. because i'm always kind of i don't know i'm just always kind of in the, in the state of of resoluting yeah, and then unresoluting year oh, round yeah, totally i mean i was just in the desert furiously journaling trying to figure out what's next for i guess i that is evidence to say that I do do that. Like I will do New Year's resolutions or like around the new year, like try to start something else or try to be someone else. I don't know. I was uh, vegan for a couple months after one new year. Look how that turned out. Don't look. Don't look. <laughs> so if you're, you know, what, usually with family or, or with mm -hmm. loved ones and you can't be, you know, I have a, I have a pretty, pretty big family and I'm not seeing them. Mm -hmm. But I gave up on going back on Christmas a few years ago. I was actually looking back on a photo that I took. Speaking of photos, there's oh. a, a photo, you know, Facebook reminds you. Sure. They're like, hey, remember, remember when you were younger and thinner? Yeah. Hi. I was uh, doing a, you know, I do filming locations. You know, I mm -hmm. tend to do that stuff. To, I did one for the movie Rocky at one of the, I think it's one of the cheesesteak places in Philly. It was either Pat's or the other one. Mm -hmm. If you're from there, I know it's a point of contention. And I remember that was three years ago. And I remember I either got, I don't know what happened. I think I might have gotten either food poisoning or really bad flu, but I Oof. was so, I almost needed to be hospitalized sick. Jesus. Where I was in and out, like kind of in and out of consciousness and for like days and just throwing up nonstop. And I don't know what it was. But I remember when I looked at that picture, I knew the next day and that was my trip to New York for Christmas. And Ugh. I just, you know, I was like, I'm not doing this i'm not yeah. going back and spending you know a lot of money and, and a lot of people clamoring and getting i mean getting sick traveling for me easy mm -hmm. i have a big family and i you know tend to go to sit you know new york city or philadelphia or you know somewhere in new mm -hmm. jersey and get sick so this is not new for me no also staying in la which is something that i usually do is the best and and even now in quarantine it still has that same feel of like you're not supposed to do anything you're supposed to stay put 
relax, eat garbage, watch shitty movies, like, sure, shoot some texts out, send some cards, whatever. But like, you are not here to do to be productive. You're here to relax. And that's I think that's a hard thing for this city in particular to kind of feel or to enact. So I'm always like, nope, you have to not send that email. No work stuff. We're not going to be working because we're going to already have this recorded. You don't care. But working on your brand doesn't count, right? Because I never stop doing <laughs> That's that. That's true. Ever. You never stop. Jason will be working on his brand around the clock. He is – his whole personality is his brand. And yes. that – you can't parse that. So yes. don't make him – don't you dare – make him stop but we want to say hello to everyone who's listening hello all hello. our patrons thank you thank you thank you thank you i want to say thank you to our government oh, that never takes a break they don't brandon gaddis jeanette link ashley matson and ben forsyth and oh. governor chris witt chris witt presides over them all yes one 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 man to rule them all yeah but they don't need ruling because they're they're yeah. killing it themselves. Yeah. Say hello to them. Thank hello, you. Hello and happy holidays specifically to you guys. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Mm -hmm. Bonus episodes. Just put up a bonus episode and then we have a documentary episode up and then you get episodes without ads or talking like this, which some people – I mean I've gotten a bunch of messages mm – -hmm. Of people going, but I, that's what I like. How is, is how is the Patreon? That warms my heart. Yeah, how's the Patreon? Like, how is that a bonus? And I was like, well, a lot of people just want the information and they don't want they to want the hear this. Goods. So we want to give them the option. And then there's also no ads in there as yeah. well. So it just gives people the option. And, you know, we want to have that happen. So thank you to anyone who's, you know, I know it's tough. And if, you know, the fact that you're just listening is Honestly, is Ugh, all support, we need. It's support enough, and it's not. It's, that's not a thing where it's like, oh yeah, right. No, no. Literally, no. just listening is enough. It has gotten me through some dark times this year, specifically, like knowing that, like people are vaguely interested in what it, we're interested in. It's been an incredible help to us. Yeah, please reach out over the holiday if you want to chat. We're both very responsive on social media. We would love to hear from you. That would be great. Yeah. Also, the Los Feliz Murder House shirt is now on Amazon, where Amazon Whoa. actually makes the shirt. They approved it. Okay. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. They Am I getting one for Christmas? I mean, I don't know. Was it, is it on your Amazon wish list or is yeah. it on your OnlyFans? It's on my OnlyFans. <laughs> I'm, I'm marketing hard for this shirt. But I'll put a link in the, in the description and, you know, in case you want, you want a corporate version of one, which is actually pretty cheap and free shipping so mm. wow you yeah. really <laughs> it's like listen well, I'm... you're always working but you're always underselling <laughs> oh yeah underselling but trying to provide some value yeah i think that's good i think that's very good yeah i i'm gonna get one why not i'm Tonight. also looking at photos of ourselves from oh this photo boy shoot. rough rough as hell I'll speak for myself. I, I feel like all of the photos I see of you look the same. Well, I'm also wearing the same thing in everything. It's a, a, one of two I'm things. wearing the same smiling pizza sh crop shirt. And it's like, you're in your – you're deep in your 30s. Like, chill out. And it also, like, the, the photos I love most – of us are the ones where like we're obscured the most yeah. <laughs> like with with a strange light show yeah it's it's very stylized photos we got yeah they're great i mean it's it's me it's my own shit that i'm working through you will via. only see the best yeah maybe you know maybe we could do for maybe for fun maybe for a patreon we can find some shitty ones one yeah to, to, like that'd be great tour for also, ourselves, exactly know. it's just like you're like what why did you yeah why did you make the decisions that you made I don't know. But yeah, we, we have so many photos. Most of them are great. We're just being hard on ourselves as we do and are. But we're really excited. There's some going to be some fun things down the line with them, hopefully. But, you know, I got my hair done safely. So let's show them off. Yeah. The good, the bad, and the Jewish. <laughs> but, Which also falls under bad, but it's okay. Yeah, it's, we, yeah, exactly. But let's get away from Judaism for a second. Let's get back to 1929 Christmas Day. When Charles Lawson's body was found, there were two notes discovered in his pocket. One said, quote, nobody to blame but, then stopped. And the other said, quote, troubles can cause. So two unfinished thoughts in his pocket. 
The $60 he withdrew before Christmas was also found in his pocket and was eventually used to help pay for the funeral costs. Of course, as you know, Arthur was still out, the oldest son, 17-year-old, getting ammo. And I can't even imagine what this kid experienced when he came back. Arthur, the only survivor. Some say that Charles waited until Arthur left to kill his family as Arthur, as you know from the photograph of you referenced it or uh, saw it, he's the biggest one in the family. They thought that maybe Charles thought that Arthur was going to stop him or, you know, try to subdue him from his mass murder, you know, the plan or, or what have you. The bodies themselves were removed and eventually embalmed in the nearby town of Madison because they're Their numbers overwhelmed the local funeral home. The funeral was at a small cemetery not far from the crime scene and attracted thousands of people and was, until recently, the largest event that the county had ever seen. Souvenir hunters began picking the bloody house clean, prompting Charles' brother, Marion Lawson, to rope off the property and begin charging admission. That is dark. That cake that Marie was baking, the raisin cake for Christmas, it was left in the house for years under glass for the tourists to see. It was later given to Arthur as some kind of dark memento. The whole family was buried together in a Stokes County cemetery, like I said. Even Charles, though, the murderer of the rest of the family. And that gravestone, which you can find online, is also really, really, really dark. Legend has it that when the leaves fall in the cemetery in autumn, they never land at his grave. To add to this already horrific Christmas story... Arthur, the lone survivor, lost the farm despite his uncle's efforts to raise money for him, started heavily drinking and died in an auto accident at age 32, leaving a wife and four children. He was buried alongside, again, this confounds me, the rest of the family. When he died, they found Marie's raisin cake in a drawer. It's like everybody dies, but this cake persists. In any case, the real question is why? Why did he do this? First, Like, was it premeditated or not? Which most people think maybe it was with the money withdrawal. But again, it's hard to know with what way the photos actually go. Was it to pave the way for a prosperous future and to have photographic evidence of that? Or it was like a last photo type of a deal. The year had been especially bad financially and it was right before the Great Depression. So that I think needs to be taken into account. There are stories of Charles Lawson sustaining a terrible head injury And there were reported odd behaviors in the months leading up to Christmas that could have signified violence based on a brain injury or mental illness or maybe a combination of the two. An autopsy report also mentions the part of the brain was underdeveloped, but I also found a source that said the brain was actually studied afterwards at Johns Hopkins and nothing abnormal was found. A few family members and friends came forward later. A few family members and friends came forward later to state that Lawson had been carrying on an incestuous affair with his daughter, Marie, and that she was pregnant, which is horrible. And now looking back on that photo, which a lot of people have done in a lot of different forums, people speculate that her dress, which is kind of like tight around the middle, that she was maybe showing her pregnancy in the photo. Again, very dark, very horrible. A friend of the family, Deborah Hampton Michael, had a very close connection to the murders. I got a lot of, again, a lot of info from local press, and she was quoted quite a bit in a lot of the stories. Michael's great uncle, Charlie Wade Hampton, was dating Marie. Her grandmother was a close friend of Fanny's, and they may have been even hanging out the night before the murders on Christmas Eve baking. She agrees with the incest motive. Quote, I talked to my grandmother about it when I was an adult, and we both agreed that Marie is obviously pregnant in the famous family photo. My first thought was that it was Charlie Wade's baby. But I asked my grandmother directly if Charlie Wade was the father, and she said, absolutely not. It was Marie's daddy's baby. And my grandfather, Hillary Hampton, was quoted in the newspaper that the reason for the murders was a, quote, family matter that he refused to comment about. In the book, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, published in 1990, also supports that incest was occurring and may have been a motive for the murders. The day before the book was to be published, the author received a phone call from Stella Lawson, daughter of Marion Lawson. And Marion was the brother of the Charlie Lawson. Stella said that she had overheard Fanny's sisters-in-law and aunts discussing how Fanny had confided in them that she had been concerned about any incestuous relationship between Charles and Marie long before the murders. So it's a dark, it's a dark Christmas tale. Very 
interesting to talk about the dynamic behind something as gruesome and horrific as the circumstance of the Lawson family that people have been talking about for a very long time and will continue to talk about. I think there's some pretty obvious things. Yeah. Big family. Big family. More responsibility. Hard to support. Yeah. It's not a strange thing mm -hmm. to to be under stress or to do something that is something you wouldn't normally do. It's Christmas time, mm -hmm. which I feel like whether it's a seasonal effective thing or it, there's also added stress on the holidays. I mean, look at history in general. Yeah. I mean, historically, people lose their minds shopping. Mm -hmm. During the holidays, and it brings out that's not the bringing out the best in you, it's bringing no. out the worst in you. you said the, the you know, we're in the depression is is looming, know, yeah, is, is right there. And then I think him taking out the money and him, I think if he was always planning on doing it and then killing himself, mm -hmm. he would probably would have done it there. I'd imagine. That's my guess. You think he was maybe going to try to escape, yes. get away, and he was like, oh my God, what have I done? I can't. Yeah, he was just like, I, there's just, you know, there's just no way I could either live with this. Obviously, was in a state of probably, I just want to be a swinging bachelor. Mm -hmm. I think he probably was like, I can't handle this. This is too much. And as these kids get older, the, res the responsibility is, is going to be compounded over a very very long time and if they're struggling then mm -hmm. and if the the country and the world is struggling then financially yeah he's like how am i there's just no way i'm going to be able to do this so he probably took out the money i mean i don't see by like, taking out the money being like oh before i kill myself let me take out the money mm -hmm. i feel like he would have done it there like i did what i was going to do and this is now my grand exit and then like you said sending out the son i kind of thought initially when you sent him to get shotgun shells that Maybe dad was going to take off. Son mm, comes back with shotgun shells, and mm -hmm. people are like, Hey, what happened here? And he's like, I don't know. I just wanted to get shotgun shells. Now everyone's dead. Yeah. Where's my dad? And they're like, well, I don't know. Maybe we're going to ask you that. Yeah. That's something that I. They may I, have gone that way. Maybe they was, he was trying to pin it on him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like there's just a lot of things that are very clear that motive. There's a lot of motives. Yeah. I mean, you, when you, you started this looking at the photo. Yeah. That's a lot. There's a lot of family there. And then you bring in the incest doesn't Oof. help. Yeah. So even without that, it's it's a pretty stacked deck. Absolutely. Trying to research this story, it's hard to know. You know, I used a lot of testimony and, you know, lots of reports, but it's hard to know because it's it's a lot of people's accounts over the generations. So it's become kind of this larger Christmas mystery as to the motive, not as to what happened, then I think it ever was was going to be just based on facts. So again, if you live or know this story and live somewhere in the, the county and have more information, we would love to hear it. I I would love to know more about this or if anyone has a different perspective or a different theory, because there's a lot of them out there. So we would love to hear it. And if you have something nice to share, you can do that too, I guess. Come on. Come on.